Good afternoon. I am Ronnie Hines. I'm the Division Director for the Division of Professions and Occupations. Thank all of you that have come today, and I think we have a number of people online um, through the webinar as well. Um, so welcome to the latest in a series of stakeholder meetings held by the division. Um, we have all of our program directors and staff that represent the prescribing boards as well. Um, I'd like to to briefly review our progress to date, but also um, definitely emphasize that we're here to, to gather your feedback um, on the suggested changes to the policy. Sorry, technical. Thank you. Um, so to review our progress to date um, and going back to the origination of the quad policy, um, in the summer of 2013, the four um, boards, medical, dental, nursing, and pharmacy convened um, and began developing policies for prescribing and dispensing opioids um, given the overlap in regulation of healthcare professions. Um, that September, we held a conference um, to consider separate policies, um, policies from other jurisdictions and expert presentations. And that resulted in a board generated idea to come up with one policy and that's the policy that you've you've seen for the past couple of years. Um, and it resulted um, after many stakeholder meetings and in June and July of 2014 the boards, those four boards adopted the joint policy. It was subsequently adopted by podiatry and optometry boards and endorsed by the veterinary board. Um, Colorado was the first in the country to adopt such common guidelines um, for all practitioners um, with these authorities. I would emphasize, I think one of the discussions that we often hear is that um, the concern that it's rule. Um, it is a policy, it is meant to be guidance, it is meant to be a resource for prescribers. Um, and, and it's really a recognition that the boards um, have acknowledged the importance of clinical judgment when prescribing and dispensing controlled substances in the treatment of pain. And we as a division, but also I think as a state, have been committed to make the policy a living document. And so with, with that in mind, we've continued to gather information. And beginning in March of last year, um, after the Centers for D D Disease Control issued their guidelines for prescribing op opioids and chronic pain um, and highlighting many similarities, but some differences with Colorado's policy, um, we began um, convening stakeholder meetings again across the state. We had stakeholder meetings in Pueblo, we had stakeholder meetings up north, we had one um, here in Denver, and um, we've begun meeting with each of the individual boards to get their feedback. We've met with other state agencies and with experts um, to come up with the, with the draft that we have right now with the comments. Um, themes of feedback have been centered around reducing the threshold from 120 to 90 per day, adding mental health treatment in the plan of care, considering medica medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, using functionality to assess effectiveness of treatment, employee, employing guidelines for levels of risk, prescribing naloxone concurrently with opioids, providing tips to avoid the initiation of opioid therapy, um, are some, of, are some of the main themes that we've had. So the, the hope today is to provide an open forum for your feedback, um, to, I, to identify areas we haven't um, previously discussed, ones that we need to revisit, um, and really to tackle the question of what, what state guidelines are, per, are best for Colorado. Um, so thank you for coming today. Thank you for um, supporting these ongoing efforts, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. I'm Karen McGovern. I'm the Deputy Division Director for Programs and Legal Affairs. Um, I echo Director Hines' comments. I'm very happy to have you here. We welcome your feedback and your um, comments, your suggestions as we try to tackle this project. Um, we are having this stakeholder meeting today. As Director Hines said, we've been going sort of throughout the year talking to people. and. Um, we have a couple of um, themes, as Director Hines said. The main thing that happened in 2016 was that the Center for Disease Control came out with their guidelines. 
When we looked at their guidelines for opioid prescribing and compared them to Colorado's guidelines, we found a lot of similarities. We both hit on risk assessment and education. We have both hit on the acute becoming long-term. Um, check PDMP was in both. Um, the medication interactions, the monitoring, the um, treating of aberrant drug behavior. Um, but there were three big differences. And the three, the, the three main differences were duration, dose, and formulation. So if you look at our guidelines, we say that if um, the patient is on opioids greater than 90 days, then the practitioner should institute safeguards. Those safeguards can be urine testing, a pain contract, um, more frequent visits, those types of things. The CDC says that less than three days of opioid treatment is sufficient for most non-traumatic pain, that you should be prescribing them greater than seven days rarely, and then the patient needs to be reevaluated in one to four weeks than at least every three months. So you can see they are, they are much lower on where they believe the duration should be. The dose is, is a big one. When we um, did our initial policy, we settled on 120 morphine equivalents a day as the, as the threshold for where precaution should be instituted. It's not... The policy doesn't say you can't give someone more than 120 morphine equivalents a day. It says if you do, then you need to make sure that precautions and safety measures are in place for that patient. The CDC says um, greater than 50 morphine equivalents a day. So that's less than half of what our recommendation was that you would implement pr um, precautions. And they say that you shouldn't go above 90 morphine equivalents a day in any circumstance. Um, and then the last is formulation. In our policy, we um, highlighted that you should implement safeguards if you're going to use certain formulations like transdermal or extended release. The CDC says you should only use immediate release, that transdermal and extended release should not be used. So those are the big differences. Um, in 2015, the question to the Colorado Consortium was, do you think that we should lower our bright line threshold? Um, their choices, they could say yes, consider it or no. And we got 29 yeses, 39 considerates, and 32 noes. So it was pretty evenly split. Um, since the CDC guidelines came out and we've done all these stakeholder meetings, we've been asking the questions of, of every stakeholder group. You know, what do people think about that? Um, there were also some guidelines that the CDC had that we didn't. And one, these are, are, are four of the bigger, the, the four of the guidelines that we've gotten the biggest response on during our stakeholder meeting. One was discussing discontinuation plan when you're initiating opioid therapy to allow the patient to understand this isn't a lifelong plan, this is a temporary therapy. Um, guidelines for special conditions. So we were pretty good about identifying drugs um, that could interact, but not conditions like sleep apnea, uh, pregnancy. Guidelines for offering naloxone. So um, we've had recommendations that uh, prescribers should give a concurrent prescription for naloxone whenever prescribing opioids. And then the CDC talks about medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, and we did not cover that in our policy. So as um, Director Hines said, we've been around, we've talked to a lot of people, we've talked to experts, the boards, stakeholder meetings across the state, and these are the suggestion, suggested additions we have for the policy. Um, we have had groups of people that disagree with the CDC guidelines, um, but surprisingly we have large groups of people that agree that we should lower our bright line threshold to um, be more consistent with the CDC. Functionality to assess opioid treatment. So um, we talk about using the pain scale. We've had a lot of feedback that we should be stressing um, the use of functionality assessment in, in, in um, determining the effectiveness of the therapy. Guidelines for level of risk. So strat 
stratifying the patients into different levels of risk, um, which will determine the safety precautions put in place. Um, a really interesting one is the alternatives to ever starting opioids. Um, there's a program with the American College of Emergency Physicians where they are piloting in several emergency rooms through the state using different kinds of therapy rather than using opioids for pain management in their ERs. Um, concurrent, we talked about the concurrent prescriptions. And I think the other thing that we really have gotten a lot of feedback about and we're pretty, um, we're pretty dedicated to including mental health treatment in this, in this policy, making sure that people understand that, that mental and behavioral health certainly have a place in the treatment of chronic pain with opioids. Um, so I'm gonna leave this list up here because when you provide feedback, I'd like you to, if you can, provide your thoughts on these suggested additions to the policy. Um, we, like I said, we're gathering feedback. We wanna hear what you think before we put pen to paper. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jo. And she is gonna be calling people up to testify. You can sit here at the table and give your comments. Okay, I think my mic. Am I on? Am I, there I am. So we'll try not to cause any exorbitant obnoxious noise between the multiple microphones. But I wanna welcome everybody. I'm Joe Donlin, I'm Director of Outreach and Education for the division, and I echo the comments that have been made. And I also wanted to give, if we could, um, many of you see these names, and our nameplates are a little bit small. So I just wanted to give each of the program directors, if we could just pass that one microphone. I don't know where it went. And Jackie, if you can start, just so that you can put names with faces, that you might see the names a lot on our website, but now's a chance to see that we are real people. Hi, I'm Jackie Arslan. I'm the Director of Strategic Operations and Program Improvement here. I'm Wendy Anderson. I'm the Program Director for the Colorado State Board of Pharmacy. Hi, I'm Paula Martinez with the Colorado Medical Board. I'm Sam Delp with the, I'm the Program Director for the Board of Nursing. Abby Gaskins, State Board of Podiatry and also Veterinary Medicine. Amy Belay, Interim Program Director for the Dental Board. Darcy Magnuson, Program Director for the Mental Health Boards. Zen Mayhew, I'm the Interim Program Director for the State Board of Optometry. Okay, thank you. As we've said, your comments are very important and I wanna thank, I know we have right now and probably more will join, but we have over 100 people on the webinar listening in all over the state. So I welcome everybody. And um, the importance of your comments really can't be overstated as the prescriber and dispensing board go forward with making revisions to this policy. I wanna let you know that we are going to plan to have another stakeholder meeting at the end of September. Um, that date has not been set, but um, we do wanna make sure that this is a very thorough process and that all stakeholders have um, a chance to make their voice heard and express their interests, um, any changes or their appreciation, whatever the case may be for the policy. So that will be sent out. It will also be posted to all the websites as this was. So be sure to keep an eye out, but right now that's planned um, for the end of September. As far as today, I just wanted to go over a few things. Um, if you wish to speak, I know um, actually not very many people in the room um, indicated that they wanna speak and some of you may change your mind. So we'll be sure to come back around to everybody. But when your name is called, as Karen said, please plan to come to the table and speak. If you are joining us via webinar, um, you may type your comment and or you may use the raise your hand feature and we will unmute your line. I will try to move between those that are on the webinar and Dan's gonna help with um, that crowd, those who are in the room. Um, and each individual will have three minutes. And I would ask that you please do three things. <clears throat> State your name and who you represent. Provide clear comments related to the policy. Try not to repeat what was already said, although I know that's very hard 
but stating that you are full in full agreement with another organization and individual is fine with us. This is being recorded, so um, we can go back and review that and it, it will be strongly recorded. If you do prefer to send written comments, please send them to Holly Weaver, who is sitting back there, and I forgot to introduce. Holly Weaver is the assistant to the deputy director, to the deputy directors, and her email is holly, H-O-L-L-I, dot weaver, W-E-A-V-E-R, at state.co.us. And for this round, we've asked on the website over the last couple of weeks that those be sent by 5 p.m. today. So obviously, if you are in the room and you need to have a sidebar discussion or make a call, please step out into the hallway. Otherwise, please put your phones on vibrate. That includes all the program directors if you have to make a note of that. So with that, um, we will get going. I would ask, I'm going to call a couple of names. Um, and if the next person can just come and sit in one of these chairs, then we can keep it moving a little bit and really utilize our time as wisely as possible. So the per first person I have is, let's see, Michael, Michael Jean Halgrimson, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, okay. Uh, Kirsten Bartles? That's me. Okay. And the next person after Kirsten will be Rachel Zaza Lynn. Does that sound right? Rachel, if you just want to, well, you're close by, so you can stay there. Well done. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kirsten Bartels. I'm an anesthesiologist and physician at Anschutz. Um, I'm also an NIH-funded investigator on a grant that looks at opioid prescription safety after surgery. I speak here on behalf of myself. I'm not <clears throat> per se authorized to speak on behalf of the aforementioned organizations. Uh, the main issue I wanted to raise is <clears throat> that the document mainly addresses chronic pain and opioids that are prescribed for chronic pain. And it's very hard to intervene at that stage. <clears throat> and maybe that's why you have a document and a policy. A lot of patients get their opioids prescribed when they're still opioid naive, and there's a lot of overprescription taking place at that time. <clears throat> Sorry. Probably you or a family member has had a minor surgery and got prescribed a large amount of opioids that's lingering around in uh, medical cabinets, and that's a source of uh, diversion, non-medical use. This document and also the uh, policy from the CDC doesn't really speak well and differentiate to that type of opioid prescribing, which is a, a vast amount of opioid prescribing that occurs in acute care settings, so emergency medicine, all the surgical specialties. This is the main issue I wanted to add. Okay, thank you very much. Rachel? You can pass. I'll circle back with you, but you can certainly pass. Um, Kimberly Jackson. Oops. Karen, do you want to move that? Do you want to get in back of the table, or would you like to be on the side, or what's most easiest? I'd like to be in back. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for having this stakeholder meeting. My name is Dr. Kimberly Jackson. I'm a non-attorney advocate and volunteer with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I'm here representing them and also representing myself. I think as a, I was a family practice physician down in Pueblo and I previously have been prescribed prescribing opioids to some of my patients, so I have experience with this. I'm currently disabled and not able to practice. Um, but one of the concerns with the recommendations that we have um, 
Well, with the recommendations in general is access to chronic pain management. Many of our members suffer from chronic pain. Many have been on opioids for years, and we hear plenty of this talk, oh, opioids aren't effective for X, Y, and Z. Well, op the other side of that is opioids are effective for something. Sure, they are a risky treatment, but when you're suffering from high levels of chronic pain, suicide levels go up, rates of all-cause mortality go up, I mean, and quality of life goes down. And so opioids are a rational treatment in that. And one of the biggest issues we have is access. With every new guideline that comes out, with every new recommendation that comes out, especially for those of us on public insurance, another provider says, you know what, this is just too hard, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And while that's good because that helps weed out some of the providers who don't have experience with this and who might benefit from these guidelines because they don't have this background, um, it makes it hard for us to get chronic pain management of any sort because that also then limits providers who do non-opioid chronic pain management because often the two are intermixed. So that's our biggest fear with these new policies is as we tighten the guidelines, it makes it harder for those of us who do benefit from opioids and who are able to work to get out of our houses, to have quality of life from these medications, it makes it harder for us to get access to them. The other concern I have with requiring behavioral health and mental health treatment is, as I'm sure you know, unfortunately, mental health and mental illness is not viewed the same way as physical illness in this country, and there is still discrimination. A great example of that is ERISA insurance policies, the Employee Retirement Secu and Income Security Act mandates a certain level of disability insurance. Many of those policies, including my own, have a stipulation in them that if you have any sort of mental or nervous disorder, that benefits are limited to 24 months or sometimes even less than that. So by requiring mental health treatment without having this parity in treatment and mental illness, we could be giving people diagnoses that could adversely affect benefits, that could adversely affect employment, and that can cause problems. I mean, I agree with the statement that mental illness treatment, mental health and behavioral health treatment is necessary when you suffer from a chronic illness because this sucks. This is hard to live with. But by mandating that without having these other things taken care of, without having that parity, we could potentially be creating problems for these patients, many of us who already have access problems and other issues because of our diagnoses. So our concern with this is just, especially as a provider, providers need guidelines. It's helpful for us to have these because we can also then say to patients, look, these are the guidelines, this is why we're doing this, which gives them a solid concrete reason. Um, but we also need to be mindful that guidelines also say to providers, this is a lot more tricky than you think, and so it can create access issues too if we're too strict. So again, thank you for holding this. I look forward to working with you as we look at this policy, um, and if you have any questions, you can reach me through the CCDC. So thank you very much. Carol Ann Figuar? Fig Fagoni. Fig oh gosh, I was I thought French, it sounds more Italian. That was really not good. And the next one will be Nicole Pentland, and then I will go to the webinar. Nicole, if you want to come up and just so you're sort of and for those on the webinar, um, just some handouts are being provided to all of the. It's a packet that she made concerning her husband. Okay. Um, so I won't count that in your three minutes. Okay. <laughs> we'll start it. Yeah, that's, that's for them to look at yes. at their convenience. But um, I did want to go to the eighth page in that book, if you will. Introduce yourself and who you represent. Hi, I'm Carol Ann Fagoni. I'm Nicole Pentland's mom. And we're representing her um, husband, Matthew Pentland. So the eighth page that you come to will basically be some, um, they're like doctor's notes with handwritten stuff on them. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly so that it goes by the three minutes. So Matthew started opiate use in 2008, really picked it up in 2009. 
you'll notice that the doctor, actually a physician's assistant, started prescribing him quantities of opiates around 40. Then it went up to 90. Then it went up to 150. Then it went up to 240. Then it went up to 300 opiates every 17, 20 days. And I'm talking about not just one opiate, but several. March 26th of last year, he picked up a, a prescription of opiates on the 25th. And March 26th, he dropped dead in their home with my five-year-old grandson home alone with him for five hours before she came home from work. We have to stop prescribing so many opiates. There is no reason somebody should be taking 300, 150 opiates in 17 days for something he was never diagnosed for. He was never diagnosed for fibromyalgia. Excuse me. He was never pro professionally diagnosed for that. He was just told, that's why your back hurts. Here, take some opiates. He was taking Norco. He was taking morphine. He was taking, God, what else, Coley? Oxycodone. Oxycodone. He was taking Zoma. He was taking Ambien all at once. And this physician's assistant who is now under investigation got my son-in-law hooked on opiates for his own personal gain and progressively shot him up from 40 pills to 300 in less than three weeks for eight years until his death. Eight years. There is no reason for that. Absolutely none. And it's got to stop. Thank you. Nicole? I'm here representing myself. My name is Nicole Pentland, and I'm a widow. I lost my husband to an accidental overdose of oxycodone on March 26, 2016. That day I came home from work. And our son, that was six at the time, ran up to me and said that daddy was sleeping. And I went into my bedroom, and that is where I found my husband of 13 years dead on the floor. In 2015, there were 17,536 deaths just from the opioid painkillers. This is legal with a, with a doctor's prescription, and this epidemic is killing more people than heroin and cocaine combined. My husband, Matthew, started Subox the Suboxone program in January of 2016. And if you're not familiar with Suboxone, it's to help with withdrawal um, symptoms. But he still remained to get his oxycodone prescription at the same time he was being prescribed the Suboxone from a different provider. The doctor that gave Matthew the prescription on March 25th is currently under investigation. This doctor, Dr. Richard Evans, told me that he was too busy to check the patient's medication list, which Suboxone was listed as an active medication on his medication list. And they were also too busy to check the prescription drug monitoring program. And that they only check to see if it is time to refill. Matthew filled his Suboxone on March 22nd at Walgreens. And on March 25th, he filled his oxycodone prescription at Safeway. I believe that if someone had taken the time to check that drug monitoring program, this could have been avoided. I had always assumed that the providers and the pharmacists checked this database automatically, not that it was just a tool that they could use if they, could, if they choose to do so. If someone had taken a minute and looked at the database, they would have seen that Matthew filled the Suboxone and was refilling the oxycodone in the same week. This should have raised some questions. I ask that you please consider making it a requirement that physicians and pharmacists check this database for every patient that is prescribed opiates. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to, I just want to thank you for coming to share your story and appreciate that you were open. I'm just going to circle back with uh, the webinar, Dan. Nobody wanted to speak. There were a couple comments. Okay. So why don't we go ahead? Are they long comments or? 
Okay, do you want to read those or do you? Okay, go ahead and. Oh, okay. We'll hold on. We got a microphone going dead. Um, I want to circle back with Michael Jean Hallgrimson. Did you want to come up? Okay. And Rachel Lynn? No? Okay. Let's see. Oh. Um, John Fox, are you in the room? Yes. Hi, I'm John Fox. I'm a family physician, rural family physician, and I'm here representing myself. Um, I'm obviously an older rural family physician as well. And I don't know what training's like nowadays, but there was absolutely no training in chronic pain management when I went through my residency. And I think that is one of the things that is sorely missing from chronic pain management. Um, there aren't enough chronic pain doctors in the state to take care of all the patients with chronic pain. And that means that a lot of us, and especially in rural areas where it's harder for our patients to get to the city, uh, have to take care of some of those patients. And you just heard what happens when people don't have the training and the skills to do what needs to be done. And that's, that's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, I, I will tell you that one of the perhaps unintended consequences of some of the guidelines that are out there are that the cost of prescription medications are now going up. And as they become more cost prohibitive um, and is, and I know you're saying we're not required to limit the amount of opiate that we're giving our patients. We just need to be, to do it correctly Okay, that's where training comes in. But the guidelines are being used by insurance companies and other people to say, no, you cannot prescribe this. As we do that, more and more people are turning to heroin. And in fact, if you look at the accidental overdose deaths from opiates, uh, they've remained relatively level since about 2011. But the number of deaths from heroin have gone up dramatically during that time frame. Um, one of the things I want to point out, I think it was on the previous slide, is that a lot of the differences between Colorado and CDC are acute versus chronic and initiation versus long term. Okay, it was one of those slides, that one. Yeah, a lot of those are acute versus chronic and initiation versus long term. And, and I think we need to be very clear on, on those specifics when we talk about a policy. Um, behavioral health, I'm very much in favor of, of behavioral health. I think it is one of the pillars of chronic pain management. One of the issues that we have in our rural community is that when I send my Medicaid patient to the local community mental health center, to get their pain management, they send them back and say, we don't do that. The other thing is that a lot of insurance companies will not allow, because none of the adjunctive medications for chronic pain are really specific for chronic pain. They're antidepressants, they're seizure meds, and we get a lot of pushback from insurance companies. Um, that makes it very difficult to use a more comprehensive chronic pain management program for the patient, which would help to decrease the overall opiate dose. Um, I also want you guys to remember that November 18th, 2004, at least the Board of Medical Examiners said, the diagnosis and treatment of pain is integral to the practice of medicine. Um, so we're being put in a bind. You got to treat it, but not 
as much as maybe the patient requires. I agree wholeheartedly that functional um, status is much more important than a pain number. Um, and I do think that, you know, everyone talks about a crisis. 100 million Americans are in chronic pain. That's you know, four times more than have diabetes, five times more than have cancer, six times more than have heart disease. Uh, that makes it a real medical problem that we need to deal with. And I, I understand the need for the guidelines. I, I get it that a lot of people don't understand how to use these meds, but I would rather see us putting more time and energy into appropriate training for chronic pain management. I mean, I finally went to the American Academy of Pain Management and spent, you know, uh, several days with them going through their program. It's a wonderful program. I feel so much more able, even though I still don't feel necessarily totally competent, but I feel a lot more able to manage chronic pain. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, anyone that's dealt with chronic pain for any length of time can feel totally competent dealing with it. Um, but I would really like to see a lot more energy put into training and, and teaching uh, providers how to take care of this problem because it's not going away. You know, it, chronic pain, so we give you blood pressure meds for 90 days and then you have to stop them? My time. Up, no, that, that. Oh, are you sure? Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I. I I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Dan, do you want to go ahead and read one of the comments that have come in? Okay, we have a comment from Doug Rosendale. Okay. He says, have you considered exactly how you would engage with mental health providers? Secondly, is there an opportunity to leverage health information technology and health information exchanges like COR, HIO, or QHN? in order to monitor drug use, assuming authorization by patients. Okay. Okay. Did you have another one? Yes. Uh, Teresa, Therese Colalancia, she says, having worked in a retail pharmacy in a Southern Colorado hospital uh, setting, I have made these observations. She also says, there is still a disconnect between prescribers and dispensers especially emergency room prescribers and surgeons. Often pharmacists are left to be the sole monitors of the prescription drug monitoring system and often have to deal with negativity when confronting these prescribers. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone have their hand raised on the webinar? Okay. Okay, next on the list is Sofia Chavez. And then we'll have Robin Stover, if you want to come up. Is Robin in? Oh, okay, you're right there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. I'm going to be reading my notes, otherwise I will get distracted. My name is Sofia Chavez, and I, have, I wear two hats. I have a small private practice, a star health and wellness, and I'm also a community navigator for Denver Health. I'm not here to represent Denver Health. But as a community navigator, I'm in and out of community. And um, I have a doctorate in natural medicine. And in October, I'm going to start a new uh, job working for the Anschutz Sheridan Clinic. And we're going to be focused on this crisis. And what I'm going to be providing is culturally based care. And my focus is I'm looking for functional outcomes. And a lot of times, when people hear the term function, uh, culturally based care. It's one of those terms like mind, body, spirit. What does it mean? Sometimes it just sounds good, but it's not really applied. And so um, oftentimes they don't get enough support. There were programs in New Mexico, in uh, the Alcalde, New Mexico, and they worked with three generations of heroin users, the grandparent, the parent, and the child. And this crisis, the opioid, was, was part of this. How do we address what that looks like? And so I'm here to support the behavioral health piece. When you mandate a behavioral health piece, it has to be culturally appropriate. 
because otherwise it just isn't going to connect with people. So really looking at that cultural piece and what does that cultural piece look like to support people? Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. And, and what people tell me is they don't get anything out of it. So we have to make sure that it's culturally appropriate for the individuals. And if we're not addressing behavior, we need to be able to address the behavior of mental health. And what that looks like is different. So we have to be able to look at that piece. What does behavioral health mean? And I think that we need to be able to separate these things into different groups, into different age groups. We have this one model in our healthcare system, and it doesn't work for everybody. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Robin Stover? It's actually Slover. Slover. Sorry. That's all right. right clearly. I'm the one who's sorry. <laughs> Uh, so my name's Robin Slover. I actually am part of that underrepresented group, a pain physician. And I work at Children's Hospital representing an underrepresented group, pediatric chronic pain patients, who I do not believe you have adequately addressed in your policy. And that's the reason that I decided to come down here. Because simply saying cancer and other palliative care facilities is not going to cover them. I am part of an interdisciplinary pain group. We have psychologists. We do PDMP checking. We do uh, drug screening. We do all the right things. By the way, we're available for any physician in the state of Colorado who wishes to call us and wants help. We're widely available. Uh, and we take any insurance or no insurance because we're children's. But uh, we see genetic disorders. We see numerous things you have never even thought of, and we use primarily long-acting forms if we use opiates, and it's less than 5% of the chronic pain patients that we see. So routinely, chronic pain uh, programs do not address pediatric needs. Your uh, 140 morphine equivalence is going to make it very hard to use methadone, for example, and we use methadone a fair amount. It's a very good drug in pediatrics. I know it's not used that often, or maybe it is in adults. I stopped doing adult chronic pain a long time ago. But uh, we would like at least some consideration or at least an exclusion made for pediatrics, given that probably the majority of that's done by uh, professionals or at least put in a proviso that it be considered uh, screened by professionals or, or someone appropriate. And that would be my request, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. Next on the list is Ava Drennan. Please state your name and who you represent. Hi, Thanks. good afternoon. My name is Ava Drennan. Um, I'm a clinical health psychologist at Health Psychology Associates, a small practice with three of us who specialize in chronic pain management. Um, so I want to just start by sharing a few basic facts today. Um, so we all know that chronic pain is extremely common. Up to 80% of medical visits involve complaints of pain. But the USA, in comparison to the rest of the world, uses way more opioids. Um, we have 4.6% of the world's population, and we account for 81% of the global use of oxycodone and 99% of the global use of hydrocodone. However, there's not really high quality evidence that opioids are effective for chronic pain lasting for a year or more. Um, despite these um, facts, physicians in the US rely heavily on opioids for pain treatment because likely this is what they're taught. Um, like one of our earlier physician speakers highlighted, most physicians are not um, trained in pain management. 
Um, in a study of U.S. medical schools, none required a class of pain, and only 3.4% of medical schools offered an elective class in pain. And that's from an uh, Institute of Medicine study. Um, another study identified that 82% of MDs rated their medical school training in pain as inadequate. So we know that scientific pain medical treatment guidelines have adopted the biopsychosocial model. So these guidelines noted that while acute pain is associated with activity in the sensory parts of the brain, uh, the chronic pain is, more, is primarily associated with activity in the emotional centers of the brain. So there's more and more empirical support for a biopsychosocial approach to the treatment of chronic pain. Um, another thing about the practice that I work um, with is that we're a training site for the CU Medical School. And so residents of that medical school get one day of biopsychosocial pain treatment methods, and that's at our clinic. And that one day is optional. So the document here, the stated intent is to support the practitioner to compassionately treat pain while addressing prescription drug abuse crisis in our state. It's also intended to educate prescribers and dispensers broadly by providing useful tools that may be utilized at point of care to support clinical decision making. The boards further recognize that decreasing uh, opioid misuse and abuse in Colorado should be addressed by collaborative and constructive policies aimed at improving prescriber education and practice, decreasing diversion, and establishing the same guidelines for all <laughs> opioid prescribers and dispensers. So this policy is excellent insofar as it goes, but I think that it has one major blind spot, and that is that the policy is focused on secondary and tertiary prevention efforts to prevent patients who have been prescribed opioids from becoming dependent upon them. However, the, patient, or the policy does not address uh, matters of primary prevention. So we need to be thinking upstream. Primary prevention requires that medical providers treat pain differently. Um, research suggests that while opioids are effective for acute pain, we need to avoid opioids when treating chronic pain, not only because of the high risks, which we've also heard of today, but also because there's not good evidence that they are effective for chronic pain. Um, the policy aspires to support practitioners to compassionately treat pain, but never mentions that science has shown the best treatments for chronic pain are not opioids. Um, the scientific evidence has determined that the best medications are often antidepressants, anticonvulsants, other types of medications. And oftentimes, the best treatments are not medications at all, but rather physical therapies and psychological therapies. The policy's purpose to support the practitioner to compassionately treat pain while addressing the prescription drug abuse crisis um, should do so by recommending the use of science-based medical treatment guidelines for chronic pain. Um, there's considerable evidence that they are associated with addiction and death, um, and that there's not a whole lot of evidence showing that they are effective for the long-term treatment of chronic pain. Oftentimes, um, the guidelines also identify pain treatments that are effective, have no risk of mortality, are free of side effects, and in many cases are actually less expensive than other um, medical treatments. So is what we would advocate for myself and the other two psychologists, um, Dr. Daniel Bruns and Dr. Don Jewell at Health Psychology Associates, is that um, so we know prescribers are likely to use opioids for pain when they're unfamiliar with safer, more effective pain treatments. One method of primary prevention would be to provide opioid prescribers with information about science-based non-opioid treatments for chronic pain. Um, one thing to consider is that the Colorado Division of Workers' Compensation has already developed such guidelines. Um, they're free, public domain, and also used by several states. Other states have adopted our Colorado guidelines. Um, the Colorado Division of Workers' Compensation also has free online webinars about the biopsychosocial model um, of chronic pain. Another primary prevention um, effort could be that DORA could also consider recommending that prescribers seek CME credits for science-based non-opioid treatments for chronic pain, such as those recommended by the guidelines, um, which is what the Colorado Division of Workers' Compensation does. Um, the Division of Work Comp also already has a course available online. Um, the MD guidelines for chronic pain um, reviewed all the high quality research on 364 different treatments for pain. And of these, two pain treatments were identified as having consistent evidence of efficacy, no risk of mortality, virtually no side effect, and being low cost. None of the residents who rotate our clinic have been able to name them so far. 
So we would advocate that the pain treatment team also include psychologists and PTs as they've um, developed treatments that science shows are safe, effective, and easily tolerated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan, how are we doing on the webinar? Okay, and Holly, if there are any more sheets with people that have indicated they would like to speak, can you please bring them to me? Ready? Okay, okay. Okay, uh, this one is from uh, John Williams, Senior MD. I am Dr. John Williams, a Senior Medical Director for United Health Care Military and Veterans, uh, a service line within United Healthcare that services 2.9 million beneficiaries in 21 Western states, including Colorado. The Colorado Prescription Drug Monitoring Program is a powerful tool for prescribers and dispensers to help reduce prescription drug misuse, abuse, and diversion. Unfortunately, this tool is not available to physician medical directors who are not directly treating patients. Despite the fact that we are closely involved in the case management of our beneficiaries, many of whom are being treated with opioids. Please consider allowing actively licensed Colorado physicians working in the capacity of a medical director for a health insurance company have access to the PDMP database. With this access, we will be able to proactively identify patients at risk and intervene before serious issues occur. Okay. Go ahead with the next one. All right. This is from Brittany Guccini. She says, we use the PDM, PDMP database. However, it is not always up to date. There is a lag time. It is useful to see a trend or history. OK. Any others? Is that uh, we have one more. OK. From Erica Alexander. She says, Erica from Longmont, Colorado. I agree with the statement how pharmacists are left to be the sole monitors of opioid prescribing through the PDMP. I worked in a hospital setting where we constantly would get opioids sent over from the ER. Check the PDMP, see that they had a large quantity for some other doctor, need to page the ER doc, track them down, etc., etc., only for them to say, I am aware, please dispense. There is no accountability on the doctor's side. That's the last one. Okay. I don't have anyone else on the list that has checked off the box that they would like to speak, but is there anyone else in the room that would like, yes, sir, please come forward. Hi, my name is John. I'm a pharmacist. Uh, indirectly rep representing Centura Health, although I'm probably here on my own behalf. Um, I agree with everybody in what they've said today, and my statement will be short, but I would like to um, articulate that there isn't a lot of incentive for the dispensing pharmacist to provide counseling on patients who are new starts on opioids or on continuing opioid therapy. Um, I do believe I'm speaking on the behalf of all practicing pharmacists and that we are available and we are all willing to help this problem. Thank you. And your last name is Turtle, correct? John? Okay. I just want to make sure I checked up the right guy. Is there anyone else in the room? Yes, sir. Please come up. Are you on one of the sign-in sheets? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Parker Smith. I'm the program director at North Star Transitions in Boulder, Colorado. We do the full continuum of care of substance abuse treatment. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here, including all of the volunteers and, and the suggestions that have been made. I'd like to um, highlight the importance of the last two bullet points. Um, you know, the discontinuation plan at the start of opioid therapy um, is of utmost importance because it's setting the baseline um, for the patient to understand that this is a short-term solution um, and if it's going to become a long-term problem that there are, are alternatives um, to, fa to find in, in that situation. Um, the mental and behavioral health um, I think should be um, you know, integrated into any patient that's going through some sort of chronic pain based on um, the mental barriers that um, are presented during this type of situation. Um, I think that 
there's room for more accountability on um, the part of the pres prescribers, um, specifically in providing more education for patients around, um, you know, the uh, the addictive behaviors that could come about as a, as a result of the use of the, the medications, um, and then also providing resources for the patient um, upon the initiation of opioid therapy for behavioral behavioral and mental health facilities, um, so they do have a resource available in case they do start to um, go down those struggles. The PDMP, I believe, um, should be a mandatory um, system to be used by prescribers. Um, the fact that it's voluntarily there and, and there is just a resource um, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. And then I think that there's also room for more peer-to-peer -peer accountability as far as the pre prescribers go. Uh, one thing that we see in addiction treatment and that we've learned from a lot of our clients um, is that you know they've been able to manipulate doctors um, into prescribing or over-prescribing. And I think that oftentimes that's something that can slip through the cracks with a provider um, and an objective opinion from another you know prescriber that's working with opiate medications um, might be able to indicate or highlight an area in which um, someone is abusing or um, it going down a path of, of, of no return. So those are the only statements that I have. And I just want to thanks again for being here and, and holding the meeting. And I'm sorry, Parker, what was your last name? Smith. Smith. Do you got him? Okay. Anyone else on the webinar? Uh, yes, we had one that just came in. Uh, this is from Jeffrey Bacon. He says, this is Jeff Bacon, CMO at Banner Healthcare on the Western Region Rules. The concern we see in the rural health area is access to chronic pain providers or to quick access to behavioral health. If a mandatory requirement of behavioral health or chronic pain consult is required, there must be better ways for quicker, quicker access from rural area. Any others? Okay. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to make a statement? Certainly. Come on. Hi, Dr. Kimberly Jackson, again, representing Colorado Cross Disability Co. Actually, representing myself in this instance. That's why these comments are separate. Thank you again for letting me speak. Um, just a few comments. I want to um, talk about spe special patient populations. We had the speaker from Children's mention pediatric populations. I am a special patient population. I have intestinal failure because of a genetic condition. My intestines don't work. I'm unable to take oral medications at all. And so I rely on transdermal preparation, sublingual preparation. Um, and IV preparations. And so people like me are often adversely affected by these policies because we have these medications, these formulations that are triggers. And I understand that as a physician. But that then makes it harder for me to get care. And so often with guidelines, we don't really look at the outliers because, well, it's hard to account for every specific instance. But it's those outliers, the patients like me, that often have the worst adverse effects from these policies in terms of accessing medicines. Um, I'd also like to just remind everyone, as I'm sure we know, this is an addiction crisis. Opioids are one of the biggest things that's being abused, but this is an addiction crisis. We have evidence that alcohol abuse is going up, and certainly there's evidence that people are switching to heroin off of prescription opioids, and cocaine and crack are still being abused, of course. And with many of these drugs, heroin, cocaine, um, methamphetamines mostly, they've been illegal. We've said no zero tolerance, zero use whatsoever, and people are still abusing these prescriptions. So while limiting access to um, substances does help somewhat, there's a lot of data too that we still have increasing rates of addiction even though we've been putting all of these increasing regulations on chronic pain. We're making it harder for chronic pain patients to get access to medicines and addiction is still going up. So I just want to remind us this is an addiction epidemic, not just an opioid epidemic and we do need to treat addiction and realize that addiction is separate. And lastly, I just want to be cautious. I feel like there's been a number of people who have come up talking about physicians and what physicians should do that aren't necessarily physicians themselves. As a family practice doctor, I had eight minutes to see a patient. I had a very limited amount of time to do this stuff. 
using nurses, using medical assistants, using people trained to do this counseling, I can increase some of this. But still, I'm not getting reimbursed. I have very limited resources. My funding, my reimbursement is getting cut all the time. And so we are very limited in what we are capable of doing with our patients and what we have the time for. So all of these things would be very nice things for us to do. But again, as someone else said, in rural areas, access is a huge problem. Family practice, the burden of treatment often falls on us. And we have very limited time to do some of these things. So I just wanted to mention those things. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay, we have someone on the webinar. Jane Brockhausen, okay. Go ahead, Jane, you're unmuted. Jane, I think you have self-muted. Okay, Jane, if you want to type in your comment, that works as well. Is there anyone else? Is that, that was it? Okay. Cheryl Clark. Hi, I'm, uh, this is Cheryl Clark. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the Mental Health Center of Denver. And while um, we don't prescribe opiates as part of our mental health treatment, uh, we also often find ourselves in a situation where folks come to us who have been started on other addictive medications like benzodiazepines. And uh, we've had a number of our, our folks, our, our patients, uh, who threaten our physicians that if they don't prescribe for them, they're going to come after them. Um, and just a few weeks ago, there was a physician in Indiana who was murdered outside of his pain management clinic when he would not provide uh, more opiates for the wife of this gentleman who uh, eventually murdered him at his car. So I think that in addition to thinking about uh, the protections that we need to put in place for all of the patients that we treat, we also need to think about how do we train our, our staff and how to discuss these issues with people uh, in an ongoing manner. So, and I agree with you from the very beginning uh, so that folks understand the support. For the most part, there are folks that chronic ongoing and begin this treatment in medical school and, and earlier uh, to, so that folks have the support and the education and training that they need to be able to appropriately discuss these issues around addictions uh, to uh, any chronic medications that have, have addictive value. Okay, thank you very much for those comments. Dan, is there anybody else? Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to make a clarification or anything like that? Is there any, I want to ask you, Karen, if there's any area in particular. Oh, okay. Do you want to come on up, Nicole? But Karen, if you can think if there's any area that we didn't get feedback on that. Just to go um, Please back to, oh, I'm sorry. Nicole Pentland. I represent myself. And I'm sorry, is your name Kimberly? Yeah, it's actually Kimberly. Kimberly. I, um, I honestly find it offensive that, you know, you only have eight minutes per patient, so you won't take the time to look up this person, especially if you know that they are there for chronic pain management and how often they come in and how much they're getting. But you won't take the time to check their database, their medical history, or anything, you just check to see if they can refill their medication and you send them on their way. I mean, that is costing lives. It costs my husband his life. Yes, I understand time is money, but this is this is a, a chronic problem. I mean, my husband took opiates for from 09 to 2016 till his death. If someone had just taken the time to look at his medical history I may still have my husband here today. I just, I don't, I think it's crap 
when I hear doctors say that they only have so much time per patient, especially if they're a chronic pain patient. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room? Okay. Dan has another one on the webinar. Tiffany? Yes. Can you oh, hear me? We can hear you, Tiffany. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Tiffany Mackey. Um, I'm actually just representing myself. Um, I was a social worker with County um, Child Welfare, so I worked with families affected by this epidemic. But most importantly, um, I was a patient for chronic pain for a genetic spinal disorder. Um, I was on opiates on and off for 12 years, um, having seven spinal surgeries. Although I can say the opiates were definitely helpful, um, I do believe that a better treatment plan could have been more effective for me in the long run. Um, I was treated by my PCP specialist and eventually transferred to pain management. Um, throughout the 12 years, I checked myself into detox facilities twice to lower my doses after surgery. And even during my second detox, my pain management doctor disagreed with the facility about decreasing my medications. Um, and so I had to basically fight to get off of them. Um, this pain management doctor um, had me on every opiate there possibly was, as well as every benzo. I do not know how I am currently alive today. Um, I am currently three years clean after my last surgery, and I did go cold turkey instead of checking myself in, um, so I did it without support or facility, um, and I do continue to struggle. So um, one thing I did notice on here that wasn't discussed was the aftercare that's needed for patients, especially those who may not have an addiction to these pills and they're able to get off once. Um, they find alternatives um, and they're offered those alternatives um, because I wasn't addicted. The second I could decrease my medication, I would, um, even when I had a pain management doctor arguing with me. So. Um, I guess my main point is that I do agree that at the beginning of any opioid therapy, there needs to be a discontinuation plan. What is the plan immediately? Um, that's what we did when social services, the second we removed children, what was the plan to get them back in immediately because we didn't want them to sit in foster care. Um, secondly, I believe there needs to be more and more alternatives before opiates are um, prescribed. Um, it wasn't until years later that I found all different kinds of different alternatives, um, up to 10, that I even recommend to people that are, you know, having the same issues um, before they ever take an opiate. Um, and as I said, aftercare and as well as a better database. And this one thing I didn't mention, my pain management doctor actually was the one who prescribed a um, mental health medication. Um, in which I don't think that was his specialty at all and should have been referred to some kind of behavioral health at the time, and he did not. So I think there needs to be some kind of better mental health um, treatment um, in the plan for any person with chronic pain. So thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay. Anyone else, Dan? Okay. Any last shot? in the room. Anyone else? Okay. And I think that'll wrap up the comments. I have a few. Um, again, anyone who would like to send in written comments, we encourage that. Um, and we will certainly accept those. And you can send those to Holly Weaver. And again, it's H-O-L-L-I dot W-E-A-V-E-R at state dot C-O dot U-S. We will be scheduling another stakeholder meeting at the end of September. Um, we hope to have a draft at that point of some revisions that people can react to. Um, but please keep an eye out for those either email alerts or on our website. As soon as we get a date, we will get that on all of the websites for all the prescribing and the dispensing boards. So is there anything else? Do you have any closing comments or? 
just thank you all so much for giving your time to come in here and and work with us on this on this really important piece of work and please we um, we set deadlines for comments that sort of coincide with our stakeholder meetings, but we are open to feedback at any time. So if you get home and you think of something you wanted to say, please send it in. And I anticipate that we'll have the date for the stakeholder meeting up by early next week. So thank, thank you. Thank you again, uh, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you to all on the webinar.